Chapter One of Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln A History, Volume Five, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter One: Hatteras and Port Royal one of the first questions which the british cabinet asked of the new american minister sent to england by mr lincoln was whether the president was serious in his proclamation of a blockade of all the ports of the states in insurrection the coast was very extensive said lord john russell stretching some three thousand miles along the atlantic and gulf of mexico was it the design of the united states to institute an effective blockade in its whole extent or to make only a declaration to that effect as to the whole and to confine the actual blockade to particular points mr adams replied that he had every reason for affirming that the blockade would be made effective that although the coastline was in reality very long yet the principal harbors were comparatively few only some seven to ten in number and those not very easy of access it would therefore not require so numerous a fleet to guard them as might appear at first thought this reply to some extent satisfied the inquiry but even had it been strictly accurate the ability of the american government to fulfil its announcement might naturally have been doubted by foreign powers our navy was rapidly falling into decadence of its ninety ships more than one half had become useless among the remaining number there were only about twenty-four that might be called really serviceable vessels that is those supplied with the indispensable modern adjunct of steam power these however were at the date of mr lincoln's inauguration not immediately available thirteen of them were on distant foreign stations two were returning home from vera cruz two were stationed at pensacola tied up by the conditions of mr buchanan's sumter and pickens truce and only three steamships were in loyal ports where they could be with certainty called to the instant service of the government if the government had been compelled to deal with an established naval power if the administration had been less vigorous and prompt in its action or if the patriotism of the people of the north had lacked its striking unanimity the want of a large fleet ready for service at a critical moment might have been followed by very serious consequences on the whole the favoring conditions were on the side of the union notwithstanding the rebels had received an acknowledgment of belligerent rights the vigorous diplomacy of mr seward deterred european powers from extending further concessions and led them to await the actual experiment of establishing the blockade which had been announced secretary wells made all possible haste to improvise a navy and the rapidity with which he accomplished his task will remain the marvel of future generations in awarding the credit of the achievement a due share must be allotted to the accomplished assistant secretary gustavus v fox who had suggested and fitted out the sumter expedition mr fox was a man of exceptional abilities with an exceptional experience he had passed eighteen years of his life in various grades of naval service from midshipman to lieutenant including also detached service as captain of one of a line of coast merchantmen resigning his commission in eighteen fifty six he had since passed five years in charge of an important manufacturing establishment to his thorough professional training was thus added a familiarity with the personnel and qualities of the navy on one hand and the currents of thought and action in civil life on the other which was of great value in his departmental duties he had affable manners a quick and accurate judgment and an equipoise of personal bearing that neither elation of victory nor depression of defeat appeared ever to disturb or change with such an assistant at his elbow secretary wells from the first was able to apply to every administrative act 
a professional scrutiny as to its need fitness and future effect which avoided many mistakes at the beginning and secured cumulative advantages the absent ships were ordered home but with the exception of the steam frigate niagara which returned from japan a fortnight after the fall of sumter help came slowly owing to the long distances orders had to be sent by mail the ships of the mediterranean squadron did not get back till midsummer and those of the african squadron not till autumn the first increase had therefore to be made by purchase and charter of merchant steamers a resource which was promptly and largely resorted to every species of craft propelled by steam which could be strengthened and fitted to carry a gun was made to do war duty the result was a motley collection of vessels nevertheless under the peculiar conditions many of them rendered admirable service in the blockade particularly those capable of considerable speed while these extemporized cruisers were sent as rapidly as possible to blockade stations the navy department began building new vessels with all the haste of which our public and private shipyards were capable seven sloops of war had been authorized by congress prior to mr lincoln's inauguration these with another of the same class were immediately begun at the several navy yards while twenty-three smaller gunboats were put under contract at private establishments and some of them were ready for service in the autumn of eighteen sixty one three ironclads were also designed and contracted for and the early achievement of one of them became historic foreign powers looked with incredulous eyes on these hasty and makeshift preparations they could not recognize a warship in an armed tug or ferry-boat or expect that a vessel whose keel was not yet laid would be afloat in ninety days more especially they could hardly anticipate that within a twelve-month there would occur a sea-fight between novel maritime inventions so unlooked for and startling as to revolutionize by that single contest the naval warfare of the world it is probable that while politely listening and apparently accepting our diplomatic promise to establish an effective blockade they mentally reserved the expectation that in the actual condition of affairs we must inevitably fail at least so far as to justify their intervention either to raise the blockade or recognize the confederate states as an independent nation whenever their convenience or interest should dictate one phase of american events was calculated to give foreign nations a truer impression and to make them hesitate in their evident inclination to accept prematurely the dismemberment of the republic as a fixed fact this was the popular unanimity of the north in its war sentiment and its unprecedented activity in pushing war measures in furnishing volunteers provisions ships and armaments in every available form and in demonstrations urging upon the government energy and action commensurate with the popular enthusiasm under the proclamations of the president and instructions of the navy department the blockade did not begin simultaneously at all points but by notifications from the various ships or fleets at their several stations considerable time thus elapsed before it became actually effective as international law required that this did not give rise to serious complications was due to two causes first that foreign nations did not hastily press their inquiry and second that the insurgents were themselves so destitute of vessels and seamen that they could take no efficient countermeasures either to break the blockade or evade it some advantage came to them from the unobstructed importation of war material during the delay gradually blockading ships appeared before their several ports and cut off their commerce by the middle of july the blockade had become reasonably complete and contraband trade could be carried on only by means of regular blockade runners a class of english built steamers afterwards specially devised for concealment and speed 
a little later the whole question of the blockade underwent a new discussion the president's proclamation establishing it was issued after the fall of sumter when war measures had to be adopted under the stress of an immediate necessity which left no time for deliberate examination in the absence of statutory provisions this seemed the only expedient at hand to shut off the commerce of the world from the rebellious states at the special session of congress an act was passed and approved by the president giving the executive authority to close insurrectionary ports and many persons contended that this procedure ought even now to be adopted the cabinet was divided on the question and the secretary of the navy submitted a long written opinion favoring the latter course he contended that a blockade was in some degree a recognition of belligerency that we had a right to treat the question as a municipal one that such an attitude would better conform to our denial of the right of secession or of de facto separation he did not however propose to withdraw the blockading fleet that would need to remain on duty as a police force to prevent actually the interdicted commerce while there was much force in this argument as a theory it had to give way to considerations of expediency foreign powers almost unanimously protested against a change of this character they seem to have based their objection chiefly upon the fear that what is known as a mere paper blockade would be attempted in this form mr seward asserted our municipal right to close the ports equally with mr wells but thought it wiser to adhere to the blockade under rules of international law as offering less room for misunderstandings with foreign nations and the president's well-considered policy from the first was by every prudential act to avoid any pretext for intervention or the dangerous complication of a foreign war the confederates resorted to a judicious and energetic use of the limited naval resources at their command they made all haste to extemporize and commission privateers but so great was their lack of vessels that only one of them made anything like a successful cruise during the first year of the war this was the sumter a screw steamer of five hundred tons formerly in passenger service between havana and new orleans fitted out and armed with five guns she succeeded in making her escape through the blockade at the mouth of the mississippi towards the end of june and continued her cruise mainly in the caribbean sea and along the south american coast capturing and burning american merchantmen until the following january a number of warships were sent in pursuit but they failed to find her till she sailed for european waters and entered the harbor of cadiz for repairs from there she went to gibraltar where unable immediately to obtain coal she was delayed until three united states vessels arrived and maintained a watch from neighboring ports with a view to her capture and this circumstance with others compelled her abandonment and sail after having made in all some eighteen captures of which number she bonded two and burned seven other privateers extemporized during the first year of the war while they became a serious annoyance to american commerce generally had a shorter career of those captured only the savannah requires special mention she was a schooner of fifty-three tons burthen with one pivot gun and was fitted out as a privateer at charleston from which port she sailed on her cruise on the second of june eighteen sixty one she captured a merchant brig on the following day about fifty miles east of charleston and the same afternoon gave chase to another vessel which she supposed would fall an easy prey she soon discovered that she had made a serious mistake the stranger proved to be the united states brig of war perry which in turn overhauled and captured the savannah about nightfall the privateersmen thirteen in number were taken off their vessel and sent to new york they were given in charge of the united states marshal and placed in confinement and on the sixteenth of july the grand jury of the united states circuit court indicted them for the crime of robbery on the high seas 
the capture of the prisoners of course came to the knowledge of the rebel government at richmond through the reports printed in the northern newspapers coupled with rumors of their probable trial and execution as pirates under the president's proclamation on the strength of these reports jefferson davis some ten days before the actual indictment wrote a letter to president lincoln which he transmitted by flag of truce through the military lines in this letter he gave notice that as a measure of retaliation for the alleged treatment of the privateersmen he had caused certain union prisoners taken by the rebel forces to be placed in strict confinement and that the confederate government will deal out to the prisoners held by it the same treatment and the same fate as shall be experienced by those captured in the savannah when a short time afterwards the battle of bull run occurred in which the confederates captured a number of union colonels and other officers this intention of the richmond authorities to make summary retaliation was further manifested by a rigorous treatment of the new captives president lincoln made no reply to the letter of mr davis the indicted prisoners were brought into court and on july twenty third pleaded not guilty an array of eminent counsel appeared for both the prosecution and the defense but on account of the illness of justice nelson of the united states supreme court sitting with the district judge the trial was finally postponed till the third monday of october before that date the operations of the war both military and naval were expanded to such a degree and the number of prisoners captured of other privateersmen as well as of the land forces had already become so considerable as to compel a radical change of practice in their treatment and disposition it grew evident that even if the crime of piracy could be legally proven against these offenders their wholesale punishment by execution could not be thought of particularly by an executive whose humane impulses were so active as those of president lincoln when the savannah prisoners were brought to trial in october after long and exhaustive arguments of opposing counsel the jury failed to agree and was discharged by the court the prisoners were remanded to custody but in january of the following year negotiations were begun for a general exchange and though some delay occurred the arrangement was brought into effectual operation in august eighteen sixty two at which time the savannah privateersmen together with some seventy or eighty others were exchanged and the question of their legal status was not thereafter raised among the earliest needs which the actual beginning of the blockade pointed out was the possession of suitable harbors on the coast of the insurrectionary states which might be used as coal depots and as points of rendezvous or harbors of refuge for the blockading fleet the navy department convened a board of competent officers early in july to study this problem meanwhile another opportunity for a successful naval exploit presented itself which was promptly taken advantage of the success of which amid the gloom of recent disasters was hailed with eager joy by the people of the north the sea front of the state of north carolina has a double coast and behind the outer one which is a mere narrow belt of sand not more than two miles wide there expand the great inland waters of albemarle and pamlico sounds there are but few practicable entrances through this outer sand-bank or false coast in latter times hatteras inlet had become the most important here the rebels had built two forts and armed them with guns brought from the norfolk navy yard fort hatteras nearest the inlet with fifteen guns and fort clark half a mile to the north with seven guns the blockading fleet soon discovered that this was a point of the utmost importance that the light rebel privateers could lie here securely in wait for passing prizes dart out and seize them and quickly retire beyond pursuit also that an unfrequented point like this offered special opportunities for the comparatively safe and easy entrance of blockade runners an expedition for its capture was therefore organized as soon as the necessary vessels could be collected in hampton roads on the twenty sixth of august flag officer silas h stringham sailed from fort monroe in command of five war steamers and two transports carrying about eight hundred troops 
under command of major general benjamin f butler after a little more than a day's sail the fleet appeared before hatteras inlet and on the two days following both forts were captured by the attacking vessels with a comparatively short and easy bombardment the delay having been occasioned by unfavorable winds the casualties were slight in the forts twelve or fifteen were killed or died of wounds and thirty-five wounded remained on the fleet there was not a single loss of life the garrisons comprising seven hundred and fifty men were formally surrendered on august twenty nine the original design was to block up the entrance by sinking vessels but upon examination both commanders united in the more prudent determination to hold and utilize the place this inlet reported stringham i consider the key to all the ports south of hatteras and only second in importance to fort monroe and hampton roads major-general john e wool who had been sent august seventeen to take command at fort monroe joined in this opinion general butler immediately returned to washington to report the joint victory and upon his representations the president and cabinet at once decided and ordered measures to hold possession of the captured forts what was still more to the point cheering evidence soon came of the existence of a friendly sentiment among the scattered residents of hatteras island and points on the neighboring mainland the officer sent to command fort clark under date of september eleven expressed his belief in the loyalty of the people on pamlico sound and that troops could be raised here for the purpose of suppressing rebellion in north carolina upon the assurance that they would not be called on to go out of the state which was the occasion of the following characteristic letter from president lincoln to general scott my dear sir since conversing with you i have concluded to request you to frame an order for recruiting north carolinians at fort hatteras i suggest it to be so framed as for us to accept a smaller force even a company if we cannot get a regiment or more what is necessary to now say about officers you will judge governor seward says he has a nephew clarence a seward i believe who would be willing to go and play colonel and assist in raising the force still it is to be considered whether the north carolinians will not prefer officers of their own i should expect they would before the expedition against hatteras set sail preparations for another naval expedition on a more extended scale were under way it will be remembered that the anaconda plan of general scott contemplated that the insurgent states should be completely enveloped such a course necessarily comprised eventual military possession of the entire coast-line and this was a part of the problem to be studied by the board of officers who had been convened by the navy department on june twenty eighth careful reports made by the board on july five and thirteen recommended that either bull's bay port royal sound or fernandina should be if possible captured and occupied both to facilitate the blockade and to furnish a base for military operations accordingly orders were issued on august two and august eleven to brigadier-general thomas w sherman to proceed to new england and recruit an expeditionary land force of twelve thousand men while captain samuel f du pont of the navy was instructed to gather a fleet of vessels at hampton roads to be used in the same movement when general sherman who must not be confounded with general william tecumseh sherman afterwards the famous leader of the march to the sea was called to washington president lincoln in presence of the cabinet explained to him that this expedition was specially favored by general scott described in a general way its extent and purpose directed that the utmost secrecy be observed both as to its organization and probable point of descent and expressed the wish of himself and his cabinet that it should be ready to start early in september fuller consideration however recalled the fact that this was the unhealthy season and the time of starting was afterwards postponed to october the details were settled by general scott and a military council of the most experienced officers obstacles and delays arose as a matter of course 
before sherman had more than three of his twelve regiments in camp on long island where he proposed to drill and equip them he was summoned to washington with his whole command to help meet the danger of a rumored movement of the enemy against the capital here the remainder of his force was gathered in constant competition with the all-absorbing accumulation of the grand army of the potomac and not without apprehension that his command would be dribbled away in fragments to this or to some one of the many urgent calls for troops which beset the administration from every quarter to guard against misunderstanding wrote lincoln to the secretary of war september eighteen i think fit to say that the joint expedition of the army and navy in which general t w sherman was and is to bear a conspicuous part is in no wise to be abandoned but must be ready to move by the first or very early in october let all preparations go forward accordingly instead of the first it was the end of october before the expedition got off on the twenty ninth a fleet of fifty sail including transports went to sea from fort monroe the naval force under command of captain dupont the following day brought a severe storm in which two or three transports with supplies were lost and others put back for safety the main fleet however assembled on the fourth of november before port royal sound and on the seventh fourteen war steamers carrying a total armament of one hundred and thirty guns stood in to the attack of the rebel forts at the port royal entrance to the north on bay point stood fort beauregard mounting twenty guns to the south on hilton head stood fort walker a much stronger work mounting twenty-three guns a broad sheet of water two miles in width spread between the two forts both were formidable earthworks scientifically constructed and armed with ordnance of no mean power fort walker had a garrison of about two hundred and fifty men and the plan of attack marked this out as the principal obstacle to overcome everything being ready and the weather fine in the early forenoon of the seventh nine of the principal war steamers with a total of one hundred and twelve guns formed in a line following each other at a distance of little more than a ship's length with dupont leading in the flagship wabash of forty-four guns moving slowly and taking continual soundings as they proceeded the line steamed by the mid-channel into the entrance between the two forts firing to the right against fort beauregard in the distance and to the left against fort walker at close range when the wabash had passed perhaps two miles beyond the forts she made a short circuit to the south and led the line outward through the entrance and as near fort walker as the depth of water permitted the ships successively delivering their fire at a distance of six hundred yards when the proper point was reached the wabash again turned and led the line inward repeating the circular manoeuvre meanwhile a flanking column of five ships with thirty guns had also passed in and stationed itself at a convenient distance where it could at the same time bombard fort walker and watch the little rebel fleet which hovered up the sound beyond range a description of such a manoeuvre may be read in a minute but it took more than an hour to execute each circuit of the ships during this time the confederate garrison of fort walker was defending its station with courage and persistence amid shot and shell which ploughed up their embankments buried them in showers of sand dismounted their guns and swept off the gunners they replied to the fire of the ships though the damage they inflicted was trifling and mainly to the rigging showing their wild aim and the disturbance and difficulty under which they fought when near one o'clock the wabash turned and for the third time led the line inward past the forts the battle was decided fort walker gave no response commander john rogers who was in the wabash as volunteer aide to the flag officer wrote 
shell fell in it not twenty-eight in a minute but as fast as a horse's feet beat the ground in a gallop the resistance was heroic but what could flesh and blood do against such a fire the wabash was a destroying angel hugging the shore calling the soundings with cold indifference slowing the engine so as only to give steerage way signalling to the vessels their various evolutions and at the same time raining shells as with target practice too fast to count commodore dupont had kindly made me his aid i stood by him and i did little things which i suppose gained me credit so when a boat was sent on shore to ask whether they had surrendered i was sent i carried the stars and stripes i found the ramparts utterly desolate and i planted the american flag upon those ramparts with my own hands first to take possession in the majesty of the united states of the rebel soil of south carolina the confederate forces were in an utter panic they deserted everything arms tents personal property were abandoned and by men intent only upon safety and spurred by overwhelming fear the casualties numbered in the forts killed eleven wounded forty-eight on the ships killed eight wounded twenty-three fort beauregard was abandoned the same evening and the union flag was raised over it at sunrise next morning upon examination during the few days following it was found that the terror and flight of the enemy extended to all the adjacent islands it had been intended after the reduction and occupation of these forts that the expedition should immediately proceed to the attack and capture of fernandina florida but the large expenditure of ammunition in the attack just made compelled the warships to wait for a new supply while general sherman on landing found the conquest so extensive as to require all his force and facilities he said we had no idea in preparing the expedition of such immense success we found to our surprise that instead of having difficult work to get one harbor after one harbor was obtained we had a half a dozen important harbors at once such a panic was created among the enemy by the fall of port royal that they deserted the whole coast from the north edisto to warsaw sound this threw into our possession not only the harbour of port royal but the magnificent harbour of st helena and the harbours of north edisto south edisto tybee roads warsaw sound and ossabaw sound there is a network of waters an inland water communication running all the way from charleston to savannah the fernandina expedition was therefore deferred and the army bent its energies to the erection of suitable forts to protect the territory and harbors which had been gained it was indeed a magnificent acquisition port royal was the finest harbor on the southern coast deep enough for the largest vessels roomy enough to hold the navies of the world twenty miles from savannah thirty miles from charleston nearly midway between them this was if not the territorial at least the agricultural heart of south carolina the famous sea island region which grows the best cotton in the world the seat of fine plantations of aristocratic families of idyllic southern homes the pride and the delight of a society upheld by slavery hospitable mansions embowered in gardens of roses oleanders and oranges terminating picturesquely long and venerable live oak avenues near by was beaufort the salubrious pleasure town of the wealthy planters where the aspiring statesmen of south carolina had plotted treason and rebellion for a generation instead of realizing the dreams of splendor and power which led them astray this grim visitation of the lincoln gunboats was their first fruit of the war they had kindled every white inhabitant in flight every homestead deserted and the slaves wandering idly over the abandoned plantations or pillaging in unrestrained license among the furniture clothing and trinkets which lay scattered and desecrated in the once proud homes of their masters End of chapter one chapter two of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 5, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 2. The Trent Affair. The public mind would probably have dwelt with more impatience and dissatisfaction upon the inaction of the armies, but for an event which turned all thoughts with deep solicitude into an entirely different channel. This was what is known as the Trent Affair, which seriously threatened to embroil the nation in a war with Great Britain. The Confederate government had appointed two new envoys to proceed to Europe and renew its application for recognition, which former diplomatic agents had failed to obtain. For this duty, ex-Senator James M. Mason of Virginia and ex-Senator John Slidell of Louisiana were selected on account of their political prominence as well as their recognized ability. On the blockade runner Theodora, they with their secretaries and families succeeded in eluding the union cruisers round charleston and in reaching havana cuba deeming themselves beyond danger of capture they made no concealment of their presence or mission but endeavoured rather to magnify their office the british consul showed them marked attention and they sought to be presented officially to the captain-general of cuba but that wary functionary explained that he received them only as distinguished gentlemen they took passage on board the british mail steamer trent for st thomas intending there to take the regular packet to england captain charles wilkes commanding the united states war steamer san jacinto just returned from an african cruise heard of the circumstance and going to havana fully informed himself of the details of their intended route the Trent, he learned, was to leave Havana on the 7th of November. That day found him stationed in the old Bahama Channel, near the northern coast of Cuba, where he had reason to believe she would pass. At about noon of the 8th, the lookout announced the approach of the Trent, and when she was sufficiently near, the San Jacinto fired a round shot across her course and displayed the American colors. The British steamer did not seem disposed to accept the warning and failed to slacken her speed, whereupon Captain Wilkes ordered a shell to be fired across her bows, which at once brought her to. Lieutenant D. M. Fairfax, with two officers and a guard of marines, left the San Jacinto and rowed to the mail steamer. The lieutenant mounted to the deck alone, leaving his officers and men in the boat he was shown to the quarter-deck where he met captain war of the trent and informing him who he was asked to see his passenger list captain war declined to show it lieutenant fairfax then told him of his information that the rebel commissioners were on board and that he must satisfy himself on that point before allowing the steamer to proceed the envoys and their secretaries came up and hearing their names mentioned asked if they were wanted lieutenant fairfax then made known in full the purport of his orders and the object of his visit to seize the confederate officials the altercation called a considerable number of passengers around the group all of them manifested open secession sympathy and some indulged in abusive language so loud and demonstrative that the lieutenant's two officers and six or eight armed men from the boat without being called mounted to the lieutenant's assistance in these unfriendly demonstrations the mail agent of the trent one commander williams a retired british naval officer made himself especially conspicuous with the declaration that he was the queen's representative and with various threats of the consequences of the affair the captain of the trent firmly but quietly refused all compliance or search and the envoys and their secretaries protested against arrest whereupon lieutenant fairfax sent one of his officers back to the san jacinto for additional force in perhaps half an hour the second boat returned from the san jacinto with some twenty-four additional men lieutenant fairfax now proceeded to execute his orders without actual violence and with all the politeness possible under the circumstances 
mason and slidell and their secretaries foreseeing the inevitable had retired to their staterooms to pack their luggage thither it was necessary to follow them and there the presence of the families of slidell and eustace created some slight confusion and a few armed marines entered the cabin but were sent back the final act of capture and removal was then carried out with formal stage solemnity captain wilkes's first instruction to lieutenant fairfax was to seize the trent as a prize but as he afterwards explained i forbore to seize her however in consequence of my being so reduced in officers and crew and the derangement it would cause innocent persons there being a large number of passengers who would have been put to great loss and inconvenience as well as disappointment from the interruption it would have caused them in not being able to join the steamer from st thomas to europe the trent was allowed to proceed on her voyage while the san jacinto steamed away for boston where she arrived on the twenty fourth of november and transferred her prisoners to fort warren the whole country rang with exultation over the exploit the feeling was greatly heightened by the general public indignation at the unfriendliness england had so far manifested to the union cause but perhaps more especially because the two persons seized had been among the most bitter and active of the secession conspirators the public press lauded captain wilkes boston gave him a banquet and the secretary of the navy wrote him a letter of emphatic approval he congratulated him on the great public service he had rendered in the capture and expressed only the reservation that his conduct in omitting to capture the vessel must not be allowed to constitute a precedent when congress met on the second of december following the house of representatives immediately passed a resolution without a dissenting voice thanking captain wilkes for his brave adroit and patriotic conduct while by other resolutions the president was requested to order the prisoners into close confinement in retaliation for similar treatment by the rebels of certain prisoners of war the strong current of public feeling approved the act without qualification and manifested an instant and united readiness to defend it president lincoln's usual cool judgment at once recognized the dangers and complications that might grow out of the occurrence a well-known writer has recorded what he said in a confidential interview on the day the news was received i fear the traitors will prove to be white elephants we must stick to american principles concerning the rights of neutrals we fought great britain for insisting by theory and practice on the right to do precisely what captain wilkes has done if great britain shall now protest against the act and demand their release we must give them up apologize for the act as a violation of our doctrines and thus forever bind her over to keep the peace in relation to neutrals and so acknowledge that she has been wrong for sixty years the cabinet generally coincided in expressing gratification and approval the international questions involved came upon them so suddenly that they were not ready with decided opinions concerning the law and policy of the case besides the true course obviously was to await the action of great britain the passengers on board the trent as well as the reports of her officers carried the news of the capture directly to england where the incident raised a storm of public opinion even more violent than that in the united states but very naturally on the opposite side the government of england relied for its information mainly upon the official report of the mail agent commander williams who had made himself so officious as the queen's representative and who true to the secession sympathies manifested by him on shipboard gave his report a strong colouring of the same character english public feeling popular and official smarted under the idea that the united states had perpetrated a gross outrage and the clamour for instant redress left no room for any calm consideration of the far-reaching questions of international law involved there seemed little possibility that a war could be avoided and england began immediate preparations for such an emergency some eight thousand troops were dispatched to canada ships were ordered to join the english squadrons in american waters and the usual proclamation issued prohibiting the export of arms and certain war supplies two days after the receipt of the news lord palmerston in a note to the queen formulated the substance of a demand to be sent to the united states he wrote november twenty ninth eighteen sixty one the general outline and tenor which appeared to meet the opinions of the cabinet would be that the washington government 
should be told that what has been done is a violation of international law and of the rights of great britain and that your majesty's government trusts that the act will be disavowed and the prisoners set free and restored to british protection and that lord lyons should be instructed that if this demand is refused he should retire from the united states on the following day the formal draft of the proposed dispatch to lord lyons was laid before the queen who together with prince albert examined it with unusual care the critical character of the communication and the imminent danger the almost certainty of a rupture and war with america which it revealed made a profound impression upon both prince albert was already suffering from the illness which terminated his life two weeks afterwards this new and grave political question gave him a sleepless night he could eat no breakfast is the entry in her majesty's diary and looked very wretched but still he was well enough on getting up to make a draft for me to write to lord russell in correction of his draft to lord lyons sent me yesterday which albert did not approve the queen returns these important drafts which upon the whole she approves but she cannot help feeling that the main draft that for communication to the american government is somewhat meagre she should have liked to have seen the expression of a hope that the american captain did not act under instructions or if he did that he misapprehended them that the united states government must be fully aware that the british government could not allow its flag to be insulted and the security of her mail communications to be placed in jeopardy and her majesty's government are unwilling to believe that the united states government intended wantonly to put an insult upon this country and to add to their many distressing complications by forcing a question of dispute upon us and that we are therefore glad to believe that upon a full consideration of the circumstances of the undoubted breach of international law committed they would spontaneously offer such redress as alone could satisfy this country viz the restoration of the unfortunate passengers and a suitable apology it proved to be the last political memorandum he ever wrote the exact language of his correction had it been sent would not have been well calculated to soothe the irritated susceptibilities of americans to the charge of violating international law to which palmerston's cold note confined itself he added the accusation of wanton insult though disclaiming a belief that it was intended but a kind and pacific spirit shines through his memorandum as a whole and it is evident that both the queen and himself gratefully remembering the welcome america had lately accorded the prince of wales shrank from the prospect of an angry war in this the queen unconsciously responded to the impulse of amity and good-will which had induced the president to modify so materially his foreign secretary's dispatch of the twenty first of may the unpremeditated thought of the ruler in each case being at once wiser and more humane than the first intention of the diplomatists it was from the intention rather than the words of the prince that the queen's ministers took their cue and modified the phraseology into more temperate shape earl russell wrote her majesty's government bearing in mind the friendly relations which have long subsisted between great britain and the united states are willing to believe that the united states naval officer who committed this aggression was not acting in compliance with any authority from his government or that if he conceived himself to be so authorized he greatly misunderstood the instructions he had received for the government of the united states must be fully aware that the british government could not allow such an affront to the national honor to pass without full reparation and her majesty's government are unwilling to believe that it could be the deliberate intention of the government of the united states unnecessarily to force into discussion between the two governments a question of so grave a character and with regard to which the whole british nation would be sure to entertain such unanimity of feeling her majesty's government therefore trusts that when this matter shall have been brought under the consideration of the government of the united states that government will of its own accord offer to the british government such redress as alone would satisfy the british nation namely the liberation of the four gentlemen and their delivery to your lordship in order that they may again be placed under british protection and a suitable apology for the aggression which has been committed should these terms not be offered by mr seward you will propose them to him 
in the private note accompanying this formal dispatch further instruction was given that if the demand were not substantially complied with in seven days lord lyons should break off diplomatic relations and return with his whole legation to london yet at the last moment lord russell himself seems to have become impressed with the brow-beating precipitancy of the whole proceeding for he added another private note better calculated than even the queen's modification to soften the disagreeable announcement to the american government he wrote to lord lyons my wish would be that at your first interview with mr seward you should not take my dispatch with you but should prepare him for it and ask him to settle it with the president and the cabinet what course they will propose the next time you should bring my dispatch and read it to him fully if he asks what will be the consequence of his refusing compliance i think you should say that you wish to leave him and the president quite free to take their own course and that you desire to abstain from anything like menace this last diplomatic touch reveals that the ministry like the queen shrank from war but that it desired to reap all the advantages of a public menace even while privately disclaiming one the british demand reached washington on the nineteenth of december it happened fortunately that lord lyons and mr seward were on excellent terms of personal friendship and the british envoy was therefore able to present the affair with all the delicacy which had been suggested by lord russell the government at washington had carefully abstained from any action other than that already mentioned lord lyons wrote mr seward received my communication seriously and with dignity but without any manifestation of dissatisfaction some further conversation ensued in consequence of questions put by him with a view to ascertain the exact character of the dispatch at the conclusion he asked me to give him to-morrow to consider the question and to communicate with the president another dispatch from lord lyons shows that mr seward asked a further delay and that lord russell's communication was not formally read to him till monday the twenty third of december if we may credit the statement of secretary wells mr seward had not expected so serious a view of the affair by the british government and his own language implies as much when in a private letter some months afterward he mentions lord lyons's communication as our first knowledge that the british government proposed to make it a question of offence or insult and so of war adding if i had been as tame as you think would have been wise in my treatment of affairs with that country i should have no standing in my own but while mr seward like most other americans was doubtless elated by the first news that the rebel envoys were captured he readily discerned that the incident was one of great diplomatic gravity and likely to be fruitful of prolonged diplomatic contention evidently in this spirit and for the purpose of reserving to the united states every advantage in the serious discussion which was unavoidable he prudently wrote in a confidential dispatch to mr adams on november twenty seventh i forbear from speaking of the capture of messrs mason and slidell the act was done by commodore wilkes without instructions and even without the knowledge of the government lord lyons has judiciously refrained from all communication with me on the subject and i thought it equally wise to reserve ourselves until we hear what the british government may have to say on the subject of the confidential first interviews between the secretary of state and the president on this important topic there is no record from what remains we may easily infer that the president clearly saw the inevitable necessities surrounding the question and was anxiously searching some method of securing for the united states whatever of indirect advantage might accrue from compliance with the british demand and of making that compliance as palatable as might be to american public opinion in this spirit we may presume he wrote the following experimental draft of a dispatch preserved in his autograph manuscript its chief proposal is to arbitrate the difficulty or in the alternative seriously to examine the question in all its aspects and out of them to formulate a binding rule for both nations to govern similar cases it was an honest and practical suggestion to turn an accidental quarrel into a great and durable transaction for the betterment of international law the dispatch of her majesty secretary for foreign affairs dated the thirtieth of november eighteen sixty one and of which 
your lordship kindly furnished me a copy has been carefully considered by the president and he directs me to say that if there existed no fact or facts pertinent to the case beyond those stated in said dispatch the reparation sought by great britain from the united states would be justly due and should be promptly made the president is unwilling to believe that her majesty's government will press for a categorical answer upon what appears to him to be only a partial record in the making up of which he has been allowed no part he is reluctant to volunteer his view of the case with no assurance that her majesty's government will consent to hear him yet this much he directs me to say that this government has intended no affront to the british flag or to the british nation nor has it intended to force into discussion an embarrassing question all which is evident by the fact hereby asserted that the act complained of was done by the officer without orders from or expectation of the government but being done it was no longer left to us to consider whether we might not to avoid a controversy waive an unimportant though a strict right because we too as well as great britain have a people justly jealous of their rights and in whose presence our government could undo the act complained of only upon a fair showing that it was wrong or at least very questionable the united states government and people are still willing to make reparation upon such showing accordingly i am instructed by the president to inquire whether her majesty's government will hear the united states upon the matter in question the president desires among other things to bring into view and have considered the existing rebellion in the united states the position great britain has assumed including her majesty's proclamation in relation thereto the relation the persons whose seizure is the subject of complaint bore to the united states and the object of their voyage at the time they were seized the knowledge which the master of the trent had of their relation to the united states and of the object of their voyage at the time he received them on board for the voyage the place of the seizure and the precedents and respective positions assumed in analogous cases between great britain and the united states upon a submission containing the foregoing facts with those set forth in the before-mentioned dispatch to your lordship together with all other facts which either party may deem material i am instructed to say the government of the united states will if agreed to by her majesty's government go to such friendly arbitration as is usual among nations and will abide the award or in the alternative her majesty's government may upon the same record determine whether any and if any what reparation is due from the united states provided no such reparation shall be different in character from nor transcend that proposed by your lordship as instructed in and by the dispatch aforesaid and provided further that the determination thus made shall be the law for all future analogous cases between great britain and the united states we may suppose that upon consultation with mr seward mr lincoln decided that desirable as this proceeding might be it was precluded by the impatient inflexible terms of the british demand only three days of the seven days grace remained if they should not by the coming thursday agree to deliver mason and slidell the british legation would close its doors and the consternation of a double war would fill the air it is probable therefore that even while writing this draft lincoln had intimated to his secretary of state the need of finding good diplomatic reasons for surrendering the prisoners a note of mr seward shows us that the cabinet meeting to consider finally the trent question was appointed for tuesday morning december twenty four but the secretary says that availing himself of the president's permission he had postponed it to wednesday morning at ten a m adding i shall then be ready it is probably true as he afterwards wrote that the whole framing of his dispatch was left to his own ingenuity and judgment and that neither the president nor any member of the cabinet had arrived at any final determination the private diary of attorney-general bates supplies us some additional details cabinet council at ten a m december twenty five to consider the relations with england on lord lyons's demand of the surrender of mason and slidell a long and interesting session lasting till two p m 
the instructions of the british minister to lord lyons were read there was read a draft of answer by the secretary of state the president's experimental draft quoted above was not read there is no mention of either the reading or the points it raised the whole discussion appears to have been confined to seward's paper there was some desultory talk a general comparing of rumours and outside information a reading of the few letters which had been received from europe mr sumner chairman of the senate committee on foreign relations was invited in and read letters he had received from john bright and richard cobden liberal members of the british parliament and devoted friends of the union during the session also there was handed in and read the dispatch just received from his government by m mercier the french minister and which in substance took the english view of the matter the diary continues mr seward's draft of letter to lord lyons was submitted by him and examined and criticised by us with apparently perfect candour and frankness all of us were impressed with the magnitude of the subject and believed that upon our decision depended the dearest interest probably the existence of the nation i waiving the question of legal right upon which all europe is against us and also many of our own best jurists urged the necessity of the case that to go to war with england now is to abandon all hope of suppressing the rebellion as we have not the possession of the land nor any support of the people of the south the maritime superiority of britain would sweep us from all the southern waters our trade would be utterly ruined and our treasury bankrupt in short that we must not have war with england there was great reluctance on the part of some of the members of the cabinet and even the president himself to acknowledge these obvious truths but all yielded to and unanimously concurred in mr seward's letter to lord lyons after some verbal and formal amendments the main fear i believe was the displeasure of our own people lest they should accuse us of timidly truckling to the power of england the published extracts from the diary of secretary chase give somewhat fully his opinion on the occasion mr chase thought it certainly was not too much to expect of a friendly nation and especially of a nation of the same blood religion and characteristic civilization as our own that in consideration of the great rights she would overlook the little wrong nor could he then persuade himself that were all the circumstances known to the english government as to ours the surrender of the rebel commissioners would be insisted upon the secretary asserted that the technical right was undoubtedly with england were the circumstances reversed our government would mr chase thought accept the explanation and let england keep her rebels and he could not divest himself of the belief that were the case fairly understood the british government would do likewise but continued secretary chase we cannot afford delays while the matter hangs in uncertainty the public mind will remain disquieted our commerce will suffer serious harm our action against the rebels must be greatly hindered and the restoration of our prosperity largely identified with that of all nations must be delayed better then to make now the sacrifice of feeling involved in the surrender of these rebels than even avoid it by the delays which explanations must occasion i give my adhesion therefore to the conclusion at which the secretary of state has arrived it is gall and wormwood to me rather than consent to the liberation of these men i would sacrifice everything i possess but i am consoled by the reflection that while nothing but severest retribution is due to them the surrender under existing circumstances is but simply doing right simply proving faithful to our own ideas and traditions under strong temptations to violate them simply giving to england and the world the most signal proof that the american nation will not under any circumstances for the sake of inflicting just punishment on rebels commit even a technical wrong against neutrals in these two recorded opinions are reflected the substantial tone and temper of the cabinet discussion which ended as both mr bates and mr seward have stated in a unanimous concurrence in the letter of reply as drawn up by the secretary of state that long and remarkably able document must be read in full both to understand the wide range of the subject which he treated and the clearness and force of his language and argument 
it constitutes one of his chief literary triumphs there is room here only to indicate the conclusions arrived at in his examination first he held that the four persons seized and their dispatches were contraband of war second that captain wilkes had a right by the law of nations to detain and search the trent third that he exercised the right in a lawful and proper manner fourth that he had a right to capture the contraband found the real issue of the case centred in the fifth question did captain wilkes exercise the right of capturing the contraband in conformity with the law of nations reciting the deficiency of recognized rules on this point mr seward held that only by taking the vessel before a prize court could the existence of contraband be lawfully established and that captain wilkes having released the vessel from capture the necessary judicial examination was prevented and the capture left unfinished or abandoned mr seward's dispatch continued i trust that i have shown to the satisfaction of the british government by a very simple and natural statement of the facts and analysis of the law applicable to them that this government has neither meditated nor practised nor approved any deliberate wrong in the transaction to which they have called its attention and on the contrary that what has happened has been simply an inadvertency consisting in a departure by the naval officer free from any wrongful motive from a rule uncertainly established and probably by the several parties concerned either imperfectly understood or entirely unknown for this error the british government has a right to expect the same reparation that we as an independent state should expect from great britain or from any other friendly nation in a similar case if i decide this case in favour of my own government i must disavow its most cherished principles and reverse and forever abandon its essential policy the country cannot afford the sacrifice if i maintain those principles and adhere to that policy i must surrender the case itself the four persons in question are now held in military custody at fort warren in the state of massachusetts they will be cheerfully liberated with the formal delivery of mason and slidell and their secretaries to the custody of the british minister the diplomatic incident was completed on the part of the united states lord russell on his part while announcing that her majesty's government differed from mr seward in some of the conclusions at which he had arrived nevertheless acknowledged that the action of the american government constituted the reparation which her majesty and the british nation had a right to expect it is not too much to say that not merely the rulers and cabinets of both nations but also those of all the great european powers were relieved from an oppressive apprehension by this termination of the affair if from one point of view the united states suffered a certain diplomatic defeat and humiliation it became in another light a real international victory the turn of affairs placed not only england but france and other nations distinctly on their good behaviour in the face of this american example of moderation they could no longer so openly brave the liberal sentiment of their own people by the countenance they had hitherto given the rebellion so far from improving or enhancing the hostile mission of mason and slidell the adventure they had undergone served to diminish their importance and circumscribe their influence the very act of their liberation compelled the british authorities sharply to define the hollow pretence under which they were sent in his instructions to the british government vessel which received them at provincetown and conveyed them to england lord lyons wrote it is hardly necessary that i should remind you that these gentlemen have no official character it will be right for you to receive them with all courtesy and respect as private gentlemen of distinction but it would be very improper to pay to them any of those honours which are paid to official persons the same result in a larger degree awaited their advent in europe under the intense publicity of which they had been the subject officials of all degrees were in a measure compelled to avoid them as political suspects 
mason was received in england with cold and studied neglect while slidell in france though privately encouraged by the emperor napoleon the third finally found himself a victim instead of a beneficiary of his selfish schemes End of chapter two chapter three of abraham lincoln a history volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org abraham lincoln a history volume five by john hay and john george nicolay chapter three the tennessee line in the state of kentucky the long game of political intrigue came to an end as the autumn of eighteen sixty one approached by a change almost as sudden as a stage transformation scene the beginning of september brought a general military activity and a state of qualified civil war this change grew naturally out of the military condition which was no longer compatible with the uncertain and expectant attitude the state had hitherto maintained the notes of preparation for fremont's campaign down the mississippi could not be ignored cairo had become a great military post giving the federal forces who held it a strategical advantage both for defence and offence against which the confederates had no corresponding foothold on the great river the first defensive work of the latter was fort pillow two hundred and fifteen miles below armed with only twelve thirty-two pounders to oppose a more formidable resistance to fremont's descent was of vital importance which general polk's west point education enabled him to realize but the mississippi with its generally level banks afforded relatively few points capable of effective defense the one most favorable to the confederate needs was at columbus in the state of kentucky eighteen miles below cairo on a high bluff commanding the river for about five miles both the union and confederate commanders coveted this position for its natural advantages were such that when fully fortified it became familiarly known as the gibraltar of the west so far through the neutrality policy of kentucky it had remained unappropriated by either side on the first day of september general polk the rebel commander at memphis sent a messenger to governor magoffin to obtain confidential information about the future plans and policy of the southern party in kentucky explaining his desire to be ahead of the enemy in occupying columbus and paducah buckner was in richmond proposing to the confederate authorities certain military movements in kentucky in advance of the action of her governor on september third they promised him as definitely as they could countenance and assistance in his scheme and soon after he accepted a brigadier general's commission from jefferson davis before his return to the west general polk had initiated the rebel invasion of kentucky whether upon information from governor magoffin or elsewhere polk ordered general gideon j pillow with his detachment of six thousand men which the abandoned missouri campaign left idle to cross the river from new madrid and occupy the town of columbus the confederate movement created a flurry in neutrality circles numerous protests went both to polk and the richmond authorities and governor harris hastened to assure governor magoffin that he was in entire ignorance of it and had appealed to jefferson davis to order the troops withdrawn even the rebel secretary of war was mystified by the report and directed polk to order the troops withdrawn from kentucky jefferson davis however either with prior knowledge or with a truer instinct telegraphed to polk 
the necessity justifies the action in his letter to davis general polk strongly argued the propriety of his course i believe if we could have found a respectable pretext it would have been better to have seized this place some months ago as i am convinced we had more friends then in kentucky than we have had since and every hour's delay made against us kentucky was fast melting away under the influence of the lincoln government he had little need to urge this view jefferson davis wrote him we cannot permit the indeterminate quantities the political elements to control our action in cases of military necessity and to governor harris security to tennessee and other parts of the confederacy is the primary object to this all else must give way further to strengthen and consolidate the important military enterprises thus begun jefferson davis now adopted a recommendation of polk that they should be combined from west to east to cross the mississippi valley and placed under the direction of one head and that head should have large discretionary powers such a position is one of very great responsibility involving and requiring large experience and extensive military knowledge and i know of no one so well equal to that task as our friend general albert s johnston johnston with the rank of general was duly assigned on september ten to the command of department number two covering in general the states of tennessee arkansas part of mississippi kentucky missouri kansas and the indian territory proceeding at once to nashville and conferring with the local authorities johnston wrote back to richmond under date of september sixteenth so far from yielding to the demand for the withdrawal of our troops i have determined to occupy bowling green at once i design to-morrow which is the earliest practicable moment to take possession of bowling green with five thousand troops and prepare to support the movement with such force as circumstances may indicate and the means at my command may allow the movement was promptly carried out buckner was put in command of the expedition and seizing several railroad trains he moved forward to bowling green on the morning of the eighteenth having sent ahead five hundred men to occupy munfordville and issuing the usual proclamation that his invasion was a measure of defence meanwhile the third column of invaders entered eastern kentucky through cumberland gap brigadier general zola coffer had eight or ten thousand men under his command in eastern tennessee but much scattered and badly armed and supplied by his active supervision he somewhat improved the organization of his forces and acquainted himself with the intricate topography of the mountain region he was in during the month of august prompted probably from kentucky he was ready early in september to join in the combined movement into that state about the tenth he advanced through cumberland gap with six regiments to cumberland ford and began planning further aggressive movements against the small union force principally home guards which had been collected and organized at camp dick robinson the strong union legislature which kentucky elected in august met in frankfort the capital on the second of september polk having securely established himself at columbus notified the governor of his presence and offered as his only excuse the alleged intention of the federal troops to occupy it the legislature not deeming the excuse sufficient passed a joint resolution instructing the governor to inform those concerned that kentucky expects the confederate or tennessee troops to be withdrawn from her soil unconditionally the governor vetoed the resolution on the ground that it did not also embrace the union troops but the legislature passed it over his veto governor magoffin now issued his proclamation as directed polk and jefferson davis replied that the confederate army would withdraw if the union army would do the same 
to this the legislature responded with another joint resolution that the conditions prescribed were an insult to the dignity of the state to which kentucky cannot listen without dishonor and that the invaders must be expelled the resolution further required general robert anderson to take instant command with authority to call out a volunteer force in all of which the governor was required to lend his aid kentucky was thus officially taken out of her false attitude of neutrality and placed in active cooperation with the federal government to maintain the union every day increased the strength and zeal of her assistance a little later in the session a law was enacted declaring enlistments under the confederate flag a misdemeanor and the invasion of kentucky by confederate soldiers a felony and prescribing heavy penalties for both finally the legislature authorized the enlistment of forty thousand volunteers to repel invasion providing also that they should be mustered into the service of the united states and cooperate with the armies of the union this was a complete revolution from the anti-coercion resolutions the previous legislature had passed in january hitherto there were no federal forces in kentucky except the brigade which lieutenant nelson had organized at camp dick robinson the home guards in various counties though supplied with arms by the federal government were acting under state militia laws general anderson commanding the military department which embraced kentucky still kept his headquarters at cincinnati and lovell h russo a prominent kentuckian engaged in organizing a brigade of kentuckians had purposely made his camp on the indiana side of the ohio river nevertheless president lincoln the governors of ohio and indiana and the various military commanders had for months been ready to go to the assistance of the kentucky unionists whenever the necessity should arise even if the neutral attitude of kentucky had not been brought to an end by the advance of the confederate forces it would have been by that of the federals a point had been reached where further inaction was impossible three days before general pillow occupied hickman fremont sent general grant to southeastern missouri to concentrate the several federal detachments drive out the enemy and destroy a rumored rebel battery at belmont his order says finally it is intended in connection with all these movements to occupy columbus kentucky as soon as possible it was in executing a part of this order that the gunboats sent to belmont extended their reconnaissance down the river and discovered the advance of the confederates on the kentucky shore an unexpected delay in the movement of one of grant's detachments occurred at the same time and that commander with military intuition postponed the continuance of the local operations in missouri and instead prepared an expedition into kentucky which became the initial step of his brilliant and fruitful campaign in that direction a few months later he saw that columbus his primary objective point was lost for the present but he also perceived that another of perhaps equal strategical value let lay within his grasp though clearly there was no time to be wasted in seizing it the gunboat reconnaissance on the mississippi river which revealed the rebel occupation of kentucky was begun on september fourth on the following day general grant having telegraphed the information to fremont and to the kentucky legislature hurriedly organized an expedition of two gunboats eighteen hundred men sixteen cannon for batteries and a supply of provisions and ammunition on transports taking personal command he started with the expedition from cairo at midnight of the fifth 
and proceeded up the ohio river to the town of paducah at the mouth of the tennessee where he arrived on the morning of the sixth a contraband trade with the rebels by means of small steamboats plying on the tennessee and cumberland rivers had called special attention to the easy communication between this point and central tennessee he landed without opposition and took possession making arrangements to fortify and permanently hold the place having done which he returned to cairo the same afternoon to report his advance and forward reinforcements the importance of the seizure was appreciated by the rebels for on the thirteenth of september buckner wrote to richmond our possession of columbus is already neutralized by that of paducah the culmination of affairs in kentucky had been carefully watched by the authorities in washington from a conference with president lincoln anderson returned on september first to cincinnati taking with him two subordinates of exceptional ability brigadier generals w t sherman and george h thomas both destined to great usefulness and fame a delegation of prominent kentuckians met him to set forth the critical condition of their state he dispatched sherman to solicit help from fremont and the governors of indiana and illinois and a week later moved his headquarters to louisville also sending thomas to camp dick robinson to take direction of affairs in that quarter by the time sherman returned from his mission the crisis had developed itself the appearance of polk's forces at columbus the action of the legislature the occupation of paducah by grant and the threatening rumors from buckner's camp created a high degree of excitement and apprehension on the sixteenth of september anderson reported zala coffer's invasion through cumberland gap upon which the president telegraphed him to assume active command in kentucky at once added to this there came to louisville on the eighteenth the positive news of buckner's advance to bowling green this information set all central kentucky in a military ferment for the widely published announcement that the state guards buckner's secession militia would meet at lexington on september twenty to have a camp drill under supervision of breckinridge humphrey marshall and other leaders seemed too plainly coincident with the triple invasion to be designed for a mere holiday arising at lexington and a junction with Salakoffer might end in a march upon frankfort the capital to disperse the legislature a simultaneous advance by buckner in force and the capture of louisville would in a brief campaign complete the subjugation of kentucky to the rebellion there remains no record to show whether or not such a plan was among the movements in advance of the governor's action which buckner discussed with jefferson davis on september three at richmond the bare possibility roused the unionists of kentucky to vigorous action with an evident distrust of governor magoffin a caucus of the union members of the legislature assumed quasi-executive authority and through the presiding officers of the two houses requested general thomas at camp dick robinson to send a regiment fully prepared for a fight to lexington in advance of the advertised camp drill of the state guards also promising that the home guards should rally in force to support it thomas ordered the movement and in spite of numerous obstacles colonel thomas e bramlett brought his regiment to the lexington fairground on the night of the nineteenth of september his advent was so sudden that he came near making important arrests john c breckinridge humphrey marshall and other leaders were present but being warned fled in different directions and the camp drill shorn of its guiding spirits 
proved powerless for the mischievous ends which had evidently been intended at louisville general anderson lost no time in an effort to meet buckner's advance there were no organized troops in the city but the brigade rousseau had been collecting on the indiana shore was hastily called across the river and joined to the louisville home guards making in all some two thousand five hundred men who were sent out by the railroad towards nashville under the personal command of sherman an expedition of the enemy had burned the important railroad bridges apparently however with the simple object of creating delay nevertheless sherman went on and occupied muldrow's hill where he was soon reinforced for the utmost efforts had been used by the governors of ohio and indiana to send to the help of kentucky every available regiment if buckner meditated the capture of louisville this show of force caused him to pause but he remained firm at bowling green increasing his army and ready to take part in whatever movement events might render feasible no serious or decisive conflicts immediately followed these various moves on the military chessboard they served merely to define the hostile frontier with polk at columbus buckner at bowling green and zollicoffer in front of cumberland gap the confederate frontier was practically along the northern tennessee line the union line ran irregularly through the center of kentucky one direct result was rapidly to eliminate the armed secessionists humphrey marshall breckinridge and others who had set up rebel camps hastened with their followers within the protection of the confederate line before further operations occurred a change of union commanders took place the excitement labors and responsibilities proved too great for the physical strength of general anderson relieved at his own request on october eighth he relinquished the command to general sherman who was designated by general scott to succeed him the new and heavy duties which fell upon him were by no means to sherman's liking i am forced into the command of this department against my will he wrote looking at his field with a purely professional eye the disproportion between the magnitude of his task and the immediate means for its accomplishment oppressed him like a nightmare there were no troops in kentucky when he came the recruits sent from other states were gradually growing into an army but as yet without drill equipment or organization kentucky itself was in a curious transition by vote of her people and her legislature she had decided to adhere to the union but as a practical incident of war many of her energetic and adventurous young men drifted to southern camps while the union property holders and heads of families were unfit or unwilling immediately to enlist in active service to sustain the cause they had espoused the home guards called into service for ten days generally refused to extend their term the arms furnished them became scattered and if not seized or stolen by young secession recruits and carried to the enemy were with difficulty recovered for use now that the general government had assumed command and the state had ordered an army many neighborhoods felt privileged to call for protection rather than furnish a quota for offence and even where they were ready to serve the enlistment of the state volunteers recently authorized by the legislature had yet scarcely begun about the middle of october mr cameron secretary of war returning from a visit to fremont passed through louisville and held a military consultation with sherman i remember taking a large map of the united states writes sherman and assuming the people of the whole south to be in rebellion that our task was to subdue them showed that mcclellan was on the left having a frontage of less than one hundred miles and fremont on the right about the same whereas i the center had from the big sandy to paducah over three hundred miles of frontier 
that mcclellan had a hundred thousand men fremont sixty thousand whereas to me had only been allotted about eighteen thousand i argued that for the purpose of defence we should have sixty thousand men at once and for offence would need two hundred thousand before we were done mr cameron who still lay on the bed threw up his hands and exclaimed great god where are they to come from i asserted that there were plenty of men at the north ready and willing to come if he would only accept their services for it was notorious that regiments had been formed in all the northwestern states whose services had been refused by the war department on the ground that they would not be needed we discussed all these matters fully in the most friendly spirit and i thought i had aroused mr cameron to a realization of the great war that was before us and was in fact upon us while recognizing many of the needs which sherman pointed out the secretary could not immediately promise him any great augmentation of his force complaints and requests of this character were constantly coming to the administration from all the commanders and governors and a letter of president lincoln written in reply to a similar strain of fault-finding from governor morton of indiana plainly indicates why such requirements in all quarters could not be immediately supplied your letter by the hand of mr prunk was received yesterday i write this letter because i wish you to believe of us as we certainly believe of you that we are doing the very best we can you do not receive arms from us as fast as you need them but it is because we have not near enough to meet all the pressing demands and we are obliged to share around what we have sending the larger share to the points which appear to need them most we have great hope that our own supply will be ample before long so that you and all others can have as many as you need i see an article in an indianapolis newspaper denouncing me for not answering your letter sent by a special messenger two or three weeks ago i did make what i thought the best answer i could to that letter as i remember it asked for ten heavy guns to be distributed with some troops at lawrenceburg madison new albany and evansville and i ordered the guns and directed you to send the troops if you had them as to kentucky you do not estimate that state as more important than i do but i am compelled to watch all points while i write this i am if not in range at least in hearing of cannon shot from an army of enemies more than one hundred thousand strong i do not expect them to capture this city but i know they would if i were to send the men and arms from here to defend louisville of which there is not a single hostile armed soldier within forty miles nor any force known to be moving upon it from any distance it is true the army in our front may make a half circle around southward and move on louisville but when they do we will make a half circle around northward and meet them and in the meantime we will get up what forces we can from other sources to also meet them i hope zala Koffer has left cumberland gap though i fear he has not because if he has i rather infer he did it because of his dread of camp dick robinson reinforced from cincinnati moving on him than because of his intention to move on louisville but if he does go round and reinforce buckner let dick robinson come round and reinforce sherman and the thing is substantially as it was when zala Koffer left cumberland gap i state this as an illustration for in fact i think if the gap is left open to us dick robinson should take it and hold it while indiana and the vicinity of louisville in kentucky can reinforce sherman faster than zala Koffer can buckner the conjectures of the president proved substantially correct 
moreover great as was the need of arms for union regiments the scarcity among the rebels was much greater of the thirty thousand stands which johnston asked for when he assumed command the rebel war department could only send him one thousand ammunition and supplies were equally wanting he called out fifty thousand volunteers from tennessee mississippi and arkansas but reinforcements from this and other sources were slow his greatest immediate help came by transferring major-general william j hardy with his division from missouri to bowling green if as sherman surmised a concentration of his detachments would have enabled him to make a successful march on louisville he was unwilling to take the risk the contingency upon which the rebel invasion was probably based the expected rising in kentucky had completely failed we have received but little accession he wrote to richmond to our ranks since the confederate forces crossed the line in fact no such enthusiastic demonstration as to justify any movements not warranted by our ability to maintain our own communications the kentuckians still come in small squads wrote one of his recruiting brigadiers i have induced the most of them to go in for the war this requires about three speeches a day when thus stirred up they go almost to a man since i have found that i can't be a general i have turned recruiting agent and sensation speaker for the brief period that i shall remain for the president johnston's policy was purely defensive he directed cumberland gap to be fortified and completed the works at columbus to meet the probable flotilla from the north supposed to carry two hundred heavy guns while buckner was vigorously admonished to hold on to bowling green he made this order when buckner had six thousand men but even when that number was doubled after the arrival of hardy johnston was occupied with calculations for defence and was asking for further reinforcements End of chapter three